Okay, good morning everybody. I hope everyone's having a wonderful day. So today we're going to be talking about amortized analysis. So last day I had uh, I started talking about this and I wanted to give you just a general idea of what to expect. So I kind of said last time that when we look at worst case analysis and when we look at also things such as data structures, very often, when I say very often, I mean for very specific structures, um, it can happen where our worst case analysis actually can be very pessimistic in this data structure setting. Uh, so what do I mean by that is often you might have operations that are actually very, very cheap to perform. And when I mean cheap, I mean that they don't take long to perform. This is in contrast to having every once in a blue moon an operation that is an expensive operation. This is one for which it takes a while. So last day I gave you a couple of examples of the situation that I'm about to outline here. And this is going to be primarily the one we'll look at today. Uh, I'll look at a couple different versions of this. They give you just a flavor for how this works. And I want to hopefully by the end of this justify to you why a certain way you perform an operation, such as resizing an array, is actually good in practice and it's informed by theory. So I'll get to that in one moment. So I just want to kind of give you this scenario just to give you a motivation for what we're doing. So this ties to the example I gave last time. So imagine I want to perform an insertion into an unsorted array. So imagine you have a bunch of elements in an array and you insert an element each time starting right at the front every time you insert into the next available spot. This is pretty typical if you just want to do, just have an array that's going to store a bunch of elements that are just not sorted, right? So you would just do this, and there's kind of two possibilities. You end up with these two. Uh, when the array isn't full, you can do this in constant time because you can keep track of, either you can keep track of the length, uh, sorry, not just the length of the array, but the number of elements that you have in your array. So you just keep track of this in a counter and you can use this to tell you where you're going to put the next element, right? So you perform just one insertion and you know exactly where it needs to go. So in this case, it takes constant time. This is an example of a cheap operation. However, you know when the array is full, uh, you end up with, with linear time. So if the array is of length n, this is going to take big O of n to perform overall if I were to consider both of these cases overall. Why? Because I have to, I have to take the array. So imagine I have my array and it's full, right? So I can't insert the next element in. So what do I have to do? I need to create an even bigger array, copy all the elements from one array into the other, and then I could do my insertion like in case one here. So in this case, you end up with a linear time operation. This is an expensive operation, but notice that in this example, the one I outlined to you, it doesn't happen very often unless your array is like always very short and it maybe doesn't get extended very much when it make it bigger. Uh, so I want to talk about this, just this general scenario, but I'll come back to this once I do a couple of quick examples and give you kind of an overall flavor for how we do this type of analysis. Uh, so first, does everybody get the general gist of the idea? So I'm going to look and try to analyze for you these cheap operations versus these long ones. And what I would like to do is have some way of measuring in a little bit more of a granular way, somewhere I could kind of really say, hey, look, I want something like that big theta result that I usually get when I get the analysis in the worst case. I want something like that, but something that accounts for the fact that Often we may have it where we actually have very, a lot of very cheap operations that happen as opposed to many expensive operations. If I were to just do worst case analysis on this, I would just tell you it makes big theta of n if the length is, is n. So why? Because worst case could be this one, right? So worst case analysis in its most broadest form is way too pessimistic for me to capture realistically this scenario. So like it is true that in the worst case that this will take linear time if you look at it as a single operation. So what we're going to do in amortized analysis, we look at the analysis of a sequence of operations as opposed to just one. So 
we're going to look for the worst case running time per operation. So this is actually a special kind of worst case analysis. So this shouldn't be confused with average case analysis. Average case analysis is something else. Here, I'm looking at the worst case per operation. So what's going to happen is I'm going to give you a sequence of operations. And then my goal is to derive the worst case running time per the number of operations I perform. So this can look like this is very much a generalization of the worst case analysis that we did and we've done up to this point. Uh, this, this amortized analysis, because of that, can actually be very useful when we think of data structures. Because when you think of a sequence of operations, what do you do with a data structure? You perform a sequence of operations. So it's quite natural that you might want to look at an amortized case like this, where you say, over time, what does what happens? <laughs> and naturally, look, if you look at the worst case per operation, now you're dealing with something that could match the perf like something that would make more sense when you think about a data structure when you have a bunch of operations happen. So for example, if I had a binary search tree or or say even just like my array example here, where I imagine the array is like a dictionary or a map, um, what I do is I perform a bunch of operations. I would like to know if they're very cheap or they're overall going to be very expensive. Uh, but so this is one way I can capture this. So just to give you a flavor for this, I'm going to first do a little warm up, and then I'm going to hopefully be able to motivate this with a with a very kind of simple example here. So what I want to do just to make sure of this, uh, I'm going to just make sure it's clear to us that what we're going to really be studying is so-called dynamic arrays. So you may know these as resizable arrays. So in different programming languages, these do exist. And they often given names. You may know them like in C++. I think, I think vector is what, what it's called in C++. Um, I know in Java, it's called array list. There's all a bunch of variants of things such as this. So where you have some sort of wrapped around structure where what happens is as the array gets too big, you resize it. So it dynamically can grow or shrink depending on how many elements are in it. So we're going to be looking at uh, at uh, dynamic arrays, which are sometimes called resizable arrays. Uh, resizable, I believe that's, yeah, resizable arrays. So I'm just going to imagine I have the array. I want to know a good way of looking at these resizable arrays such that I, I try to delineate that case. You remember the two cases over there? Maybe there's a way I can manage my resizing of the array such that I get really good amortized cost. So what I mean by that, I mean more frequently you're going to end up with a lot of these very cheap operations as opposed to a bunch of expensive operations. So I'm just going to do a little warm up. Just, I'm going to consider instead a sorted array. So I'm going to consider if the array was representing, say, a dictionary. So, so for our purposes, just think of it like just a sorted array. And this is just going to be a little bit of a warm up. So I just want to kind of give you the flavor for what we're going to do. So I want you to imagine we have n plus 1 operations that are going to happen. So I'm going to consider n plus 1 operations uh, of put, or sometimes people call this insert, of put or insert into an array of length of length n. So if I want to maintain an array that is in sorted order, one natural way I can do this is, of course, I can scan from left to right in the array. I find where I should place, place the element, and then I shuffle all the ones that are larger than it to the right by one, assuming that there's space for me to shuffle them over. So I can do that, of course. So when I, so if I, so insert takes big O of n 
time, time to insert an element, insert an element into its position, into its position, then shuffles the remaining elements over, if any. So I can do this for the, so I want you to look at each one of our operations. So imagine I do one insertion of some element into the array. So it goes into probably the first spot. And then I have the second operation that happens. It's either gonna go in the first spot or it's gonna shuffle over one element. When I have the next insertion, I'm gonna either put in the first position, shuffle, second position, shuffle, or it's gonna go on the end of these two elements and so on and so on and so on. So for the first N operations, I'm going to have room to place all the elements. However, however, notice I'm considering N plus one operations of these insertions. So could somebody tell me what happens on that N plus one operation? What happens to my array? Is it, is it M, is, is there room for any more elements? <laughs> No, there's no, yeah, I'm gonna allocate a new array. I need a bigger one. So, so however, so everybody's on ball, it's Friday. Uh, however, for operation n plus one, and I'm just going to assume that the array size is doubled, just, just for simplicity. I'll try to justify this at some point for you today. You may have heard of this advice at some point during your studies. If you haven't, it's a pretty, it's pretty good advice. Um, so the array size, uh, the array size is doubled as the array is full. So I must stress that we're putting them into the position for which it maintains all of the elements in sorted order. So naturally you're gonna have everything sort of clumped at the front of the array and you're gonna shuffle over everything. And now it must be stressed that for any one of these operations that I just described to you, it's gonna take linear time uh, at most, right? Now, of course you can be more granular about, well, okay, well, I only have the first three or first four, but generally you're gonna say, oh yeah, it takes linear time in the worst case, right? As if the array is full, which, if you think about it, okay, so for this n plus one, I have to allocate a new array that's twice as big, and then I perform the insertion after I copy everything over. That overall still is big O of n time, right? It's just twice as big, <laughs> which is, is big O of n time still. So I want you to think about this. So each one of my operations takes big O of N. So big O of N, big O of N, big O of N. And this happens for all N plus one operations. So each operation takes big O of N time. So in total, uh, so for N plus one operations, The total running time is big O of n, n plus one times n. But I wanna know what the worst case running time is per operation. How many operations happened? n plus one of them, right? So what should, what should the, if I'm looking at the worst case to running time per operation, what should it be? Tell me in big O. Well, in total, remember, over all the n plus one operations, it's n big O of n squared. But remember, I wanna know the worst case running time per operation. So, so how many operations happen? There's n plus one of them. 
So what should what should what should the worst case running time per operation be then? So if I know overall the total running time is this, and I do n plus one operations, how many are there? Big O of n, yeah, big O of n. So I want to know the worst case running time per operation. So when you think per operation, think okay. It's the total number of operations over all the operations divided by the number of operations. So, implying, implying insert, insert has running time. Now this is sort of the phrase I want you to get used to hearing. Running time, uh, big O of N amortized. And whenever you see amortize, just think over time. Over time, uh, you could see, okay. Well, now this is the thing about this. In this example, notice that every single one of my operations all take, in the worst case, big O of N. And naturally, when you look at the amortized running time, it's big O of N. So notice that we're not this 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 uh, this process that I have it ends up that really all of them really reflect an expensive operation. Now this is a bit different than my other scenario, right? In the other scenario, I had like many many cheap operations that happen, and then there's just one expensive one that happens every once in a while when the array gets full, right? So I want to kind of give you just kind of a comparison of between uh, just to give you kind of a, a visualization of how this works. So that I could give you some intuition when we start considering now the case when the array is unsorted and I do what I just described earlier. And so I could give you kind of a general game plan for how you do amortized analysis. So at first you might, Dan, like how do I know it's the word how I divided by n plus one and that I'm going to give you a technique for doing this. But let me just give you a quick comparison between our two processes. So so I want to first talk about if I had an unsorted array of length n and I perform insertions into it. Remember I start at the, I, keep, I just keep putting elements in. So imagine this is my array and I'm going to, each one of these bottles is an element I'm inserting in. I'm just counting up the, the, the operation in terms of its time complexity. So each one of these is very cheap, right? I just do constant amount of time, each one of them. I, d I keep doing this, right? I keep doing this until the array gets full. Uh oh, it, it looks like it, it's about to get full. So if I were to put one more here, um, what do I need to do? I need to allocate a larger array. I need a larger array. So I'm going to allocate this space. I'm gonna copy all of these into the larger array. I lost the wrapper in there. The Ferio Rocher. Ferio Rocher. <laughs> the, um, so when I put, now I have all my elements in a larger array, and then I put the one in here. Notice that many of these are cheap. So the intuition here is that when I do this process, notice that I only had to, I only had to dump it into this bucket once, right? Just to give you a comparison between that and what I just described to you on the board just over there, is every single time I do one of those operations, I perform some insertion, I keep it in sorted order. But remember, each one of them takes linear time. Now, from an asymptotic standpoint, there's not very much of a difference between imagining if I took this, this is all my operations that are gonna happen for, actually, let me just take out one because that was the, the one extra. So remember, I told you they all take linear time every single time. So it's no different than if I were to go, whoops, I lost one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I keep doing this until I reach operation N. And then, oh no, I need more space. And imagine this is bigger than, than this one, so it could fit it. And then I insert my last element. So notice that this is actually a lot more work. But notice that in, if you just looked at this from a worst case analysis standpoint, you would just say that, okay, both of them are big theta n. 
but that that doesn't that's not very helpful for us. Notice how radically different these two things are, right? So amortized analysis is going to help us delineate from this, whatever this was, <laughs> from the first scenario. So that's going to be my goal for you is to distinguish between these two things for you. Is that clear, everybody? And yes, I did lose one bottle. That element, make sure you don't lose elements when you're doing insertions like that. Um, yes. Yes, yes, so when you read the word amortized, you should think worst case running time per operation. Uh, so, so that's what amortize is going to mean when we say that. Uh, so uh, just to make sure I'm clear, so when you write big O of n, n plus one times n, of course this can be simplified to big O of n squared because they belong to the exact same set of functions. Uh, because if you expand this out, you'll have n squared plus n, which you can prove is actually part of the exact same set of complexity functions as big O of n squared has. They're the exact same set. N, n squared belongs to the same set. So n squared, n squared plus n, they're actually both members of big O of n squared. Just like you can actually prove that that set is actually equal to this set. But I, I'm not gonna get into too many of those details. It's just, you could simplify it further. That's, I kept that there because I wanted to just justify for you, okay, where does this, big O of n come from. Uh, so, so let's see, I got a question in the chat uh, about differing uh, between, between the two scenarios, I guess. Let me see here. I just want to make sure I read that one. Okay, so what if the array is not sorted and two different possibilities differ, differ a lot? Which one do we choose as the big O of, of the operation? So this is what we're going to do today. So I'm going to show you how you do this process. Because when you're doing this, like obviously all we've seen up to this point is I do worst case analysis, then I count up the operations in the worst case, and then I end up with my, my complexity function, then I compute out the big O or big theta or whatever I would like to use. Um, here, we have to be a bit more careful. So we're gonna do something a little different. And that brings me actually perfectly to the next, next thing I wanna say. So to do our amortized analysis, today I'm gonna use what is called the aggregate method. Uh, so, so what I'm going to describe to you is so-called the aggregate method. And this is the one we're going to use today to compute the amortized cost of an operation. So this one is gonna naturally follow from exactly what I just described earlier, but I'm gonna give you a little bit more in a much more exact way. So I'm gonna say if, if the total cost of performing of performing n operations operations is is big O uh, let's let me just rewrite that a little bit is big O of t of n and now remember n here is the number of operations. So just keep that in mind. Then the amortized the amortized costs or complexity. So some people call this the amortized cost. Some will call this the amortized complexity. I'll usually call it the amortized complexity. It depends on the context it's being used. Of the operation, of the operation is big O of T of N all over N. So that's what I did last time. So that's how you actually could compute the amortized complexity. That's what we did actually in our previous example. All I did was I just took what I described in words and now, now I've translated that into something more exact. So I'm gonna just give you a general game plan for how we can, we can perform this type of analysis using the aggregate method. So in plain language, so here's kind of the strategy for how we're going to do this. In plain language, in plain language, one, 
we typically identify a sequence for any n operations. So when I say that, you'll often will have a scenario where like I'm looking at the insertion of a given data structure. And I want to identify a sequence. This is going to represent actually the cost of each operation. So I'm going to imagine for general n. Now notice in my previous example, I just assumed that there's n plus 1 operations and I made some assumptions about the data structure. I'm going to try to make as few assumptions about what the data structure is going to look like. But you can adapt amortized analysis for particular scenarios, just like the one I did before. But that's why it's actually kind of useful in this way. It's easy to adapt to scenarios where you may encounter it in practice. Then, then actually, I was going to say, instead of then, I'll say the, my apologies, the, the cost of each operation, then sum them together, sum them together to obtain T of n. Remember, T is just a name for a complexity function. So we're going to identify a sequence for any o n operations. And these are going to be the costs of each operation. So I'm going to assign costs to each one of my operations. So like in my example I had at the beginning, I may assign a cost to an insertion. I may a cost, assign a cost to a copy. So that's actually what I'm going to do in my example. You can assign more costs if you need to. Uh, but uh, for us, that will be perfectly fine. Uh, so now this is the second part, is the idea is to compute is the compute the largest possible cost across any sequence of operations we are interested in. We are interested in. Then divide that, then divide, then divide that by the number of operations n. So this is going to be kind of like the general game plan. So I'm going to adapt this to do an example so that you could see what I'm going to do. So notice that when I'm doing this in this case, this is a little different than I did over there where I did a little bit of a cruder kind of analysis because I had more assumptions I could play around with. Here instead, I'm going to have any n operations. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some scenario that's going to happen. And I'm going to try to count a, determine a sequence. And for each operation, I'm going to tell you the total, the cost for performing that operation. And the goal is when I get T of n, that's just going to be the sum of all of them over all n operations. So I'm going to come up with a general formula for doing this. And then all I do is I divide it by n, and then we're done. <laughs> that's, that's sort of the trick. Does everybody understand the game plan? So uh, once you see the example, you'll see how I'm going to do this part. This part's probably the most important one. So I want to take draw my attention to the practice of doubling the size of an array. Uh, now, how many of you have in the chat? Uh, you could raise your hand, or you can give me a thumbs up. Actually, give me a thumbs up. How many of you have ever heard that, say, whether it be in lab, whether it be in another course, you've been told, Dan, or like if I asked you, okay, what's a good way you can like resize an array if it gets full? You may be told at some point to double the size of the array. You may be told, oh, just double it, just double it. Uh, so you might ask, well, why, is, why would you do this? Why can't I just like add 50 or something, add some like constant number to it? So I could take like the length and I can add like 10 to it every single time. You may have seen it like this before, 
I mostly want to justify for you that this a doubling approach with a dynamic array where you want to have it where this array can get bigger or smaller when it gets full or gets a little too small. I mean, as in when I say too small, I mean there's too few elements in it and you may want to shrink it down. Uh, the practice of doubling like this is actually something that's informed both by practice and theory. And I'm going to talk briefly about that towards the end of this lecture. So let me just do an example. So I want to come back to our unsorted array dictionary. So just think of it as an unsorted array. And I want to draw up, I, I want my scenario is going to be as follows. So I'm going to start with an array of length of length one, which is going to be equal to two to the power, which is equal to two to the power of zero. So whenever the array gets full, it's going to get double in its size. So, so I'm just going to say the arrays will be doubled uh, whenever Whenever an insertion happens when it is full. So when the array gets full, so I'll trigger this when I try to do an insertion. So remember when I say the array is going to be doubled, what I actually mean is I'm going to allocate memory for an array that's twice as big and I'm going to perform copies. I'm going to copy all the elements that were in the array before into this new larger one from left to right. I'm going to sweep them in and then I'm going to just plop my inserted element at the end of all of my elements that I've copied over. So not the end of the array, just the end of all the elements I have placed into the original array, sweeping from left to right. So I want to draw you a picture to really kind of help think about this. So I'm going to need a couple colors to help me with this. So, I want you to imagine I have some array. And to make this easier for you to see, I'm just going to keep with just one array here. I'm also going to need a red marker. It's fun. This marker smells like cherries. I've had this one for years. <sighs> It smells delicious. I, I recommend don't hop markers, normal markers. These are scented ones. <laughs> Though I don't know what they have in this that keeps it safe from huffing this stuff too much. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing that. <laughs> but it does smell like cherries. If, if I could, I would let you try it yourself. But no, I've had this marker for a number of years. It's actually kind of amazing it still works. I've had this for like eight years or something like that, and it still works. <laughs> Anyways, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine I perform, every time I do an insertion, I'm going to color it red whenever I'm not going to resize the array. So imagine I start off with an array of length one. So I would just insert the element into the first position, right? Uh, <laughs> which books Kate would say? Yes, exactly. Um, so when I perform the insertion into an array of length one, I can do it. However, when I try to insert another element in, what happens? I have to double the length of the array. So now my array goes from being length one to length two, and then I can perform my insertion. So now I have it. So now I have a length two array, I insert it in. But now notice that when I try to insert the next element in, because I've doubled the length of the array, now I'm going to have nothing here, right? So I'm going to need to make the array even bigger. So I'm going to double its length. Now its length is going to be four. And now, hey, look at this, look at this. Uh, so if I have this spot here, then I have that spot. Here I could just insert it safely because now I have a spot to put it in. However, now I try to do it again over here. 
What happens? N now, now I have to make more space again. So then I double the length of the array. And you would double it to, I think I need a little bit more here. I need eight. So I double the length here. And then I end up having it so that I can insert in. And then now for all of these other ones, the great thing is now all of these, these are all cheap. I could just insert them in until I reach this spot and I'll have to double it again. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm gonna to try to create a so-called piecewise function that's gonna count the costs for the red squares. And then I'm going to have, so one case is gonna be these red squares and another case is gonna be these blue squares. So I'm gonna create a function that's gonna represent this cost. And so I'm gonna say we define, we define the time taken or cost. Uh, I'm gonna call this C of I of operation I. So I'm gonna define it as a piecewise function. Now, if you don't remember what that is, it's just simply I'm going to have the word, the value can be taken on depending on one of two circumstances. You're gonna see what I mean. So I want you to think about this. What happened, when, when do I get a blue square? Uh, what happens when I get a blue square? That's when I get the resizing happening. I'm gonna call this case one, but that happens whenever the following happens. So watch this, watch this. So there's gonna be this case where of course, so remember this is operation one, this is operation two, this is operation three, this is operation four, five, six, eight, and so on. So when I'm doing this, uh, you gotta think about it in another term. So when I get a blue square, notice that it's always one less than a next power of two. So watch this. So if, if I notice that operation I is going to be a blue square, it must be that I minus one if I check I minus one, that's gonna be some power of two. So this is what I call, these are the blue squares. So this is blue. So the cost for that, what is the cost? Let's think about it. So I perform, I have to do two things. I have to take I minus one elements. So that's all the elements that would be just preceding it. I have to copy these into the new array. Then I have to do the one insertion. So the total cost for that would be, would be I. So just, just to be clear, that's I minus one copies and then just one insertion. So that's gonna be my blue case. So I'm gonna call this oftentimes case one. So I'm just gonna call this case one. So whenever this is the case, when I minus one equals some power of two, it's going to be that the cost is I. Now, otherwise, what happens? I have my red squares, but what happens with the red squares? The red squares are simply whenever I just put, put plop it right in, right? <laughs> but how, how many operations is that if I think about it in terms of copies or insertions? It's just a single insertion, right? So, so the cost otherwise is just one. So I'm gonna call this case two. This is your red squares. And so this happens when I do one insertion. And you might ask Dan, why would you say this? Uh, well, think about it, the case one Case one, this is our nasty case. This is when we have the expensive operation that happens, like at the beginning of lecture. This is our cheap operation. So what I'm going to do now, now this, this is where the finesse of doing this comes into play. Now, if you're wondering, in the notes, I actually do have a table. If you're not convinced by these squares, if you wanna see a table fully with everything laid out, I actually gonna have it in the notes afterwards. So if you wanna really just see like, okay, Dan, how did you get this like formula? Just 
the table will be available to you after lecture, okay? So I want to count up how many times this case one happened versus case two. And once I have that information, I'm going to try to add up all of these costs for n operations. So notice I have a general way of capturing any one operation. That's the trick here. So when I break them up, so you notice I had those two cases, I'm going to write a formula that's going to represent for any operation i, one of these two cases that could happen. So that's how it pops up. So just for the purposes of time, I'll let you think about this. If, if this happens every single time i minus 1 is a power of 2, you might ask, okay, well, how many times is that? Um, well, if, you, if it happens every time there's roughly a power of 2, you should think logarithmic. It's something that's going to happen a logarithmic number of times. Why? Because every time we go up, we increase by 1. Whenever I hit a power of 2, I want to know how many times those powers of 2 are touched upon. So if I have, say, for example, um, like say if I have, for example, 4, notice that I have to hit two, two square, I have to hit, like I start off with this one here, but notice that I just put it right in. Here I have to resize, I have to resize, but when I get the operation four by that time, I have to resize it at least twice, right? So it makes sense that it has to happen twice. <laughs> so you could keep this pattern going along, but I'll tell you that this occurs the ceiling of log base two of n times. So the ceiling, remember, when you see these brackets that are like this, it always means round up. This is in contrast to floor. This means round down. So I'm just rounding it up because oftentimes we'll have it where we do the copy and then what happens is we do a bunch of simple operations. So case one occurs occurs the ceiling log base two of n times as the array is resized is resized whenever whenever i minus 1 equals the following equals to the power of 0 to the power of 1 2 squared 2 cubed all the way up to 2 to the power of the ceiling of log base 2 of n minus 1. So I'm just going to have... So all I'm doing is I'm just counting up how many times case 1 is going to happen. So when you look at this picture, when you look at i minus 1, and you notice it lands on a power of 2, that's whenever we get the blue square. Does everybody see that? So it's, it's, very, it's a very, very neat little way of devising this. So naturally, case two is all the operations minus this. <laughs> case two, these are my red squares, happens n minus the ceiling of log base two of n, n times. So I'm going to end up with this nice way of describing the cost for any one given operation. So I have a sequence of n of them. Now I have a general formula for doing this. Like I said, it's a little more nitty gritty than when we do worst case analysis. So let me put this all together. Are we okay? Everybody give me a thumbs up. Are we okay with this? So remember, this is our expensive operation. That's the cheap one. And just think of the red squares versus the blue squares. And if you really just like, Dan, I don't really get this picture, look at the table when you see it after class, okay? Because that's another way you can easily see the pattern. And that's actually something I do recommend if you're trying to do this type of analysis. Try just laying out each operation and see how, much, how many operations happen from the ones you're counting. Uh, sometimes you can see the pattern by just writing out rows. But for the sake of time, I just thought I would draw you a fun picture. So now I'm going to put all this together so we can get the amortized complexity. I lost my penguin. I seem to be losing everything today. I guess that's how Fridays go. <laughs> Let's see here. Let's see here. Okay. So now, then, the total time, then the total time 
that says time. That was a that was a burrito that melted in the microwave. <laughs> the, the total time taken uh, to perform a sequence of n uh, insert operations is the following. So now this is what t of n is. So here's t of n. T of n is going to be the sum over all of my costs. That's what I defined it as. That's the sum of all the costs over all of them. So I have a sum from i is equal to 1 to n. So I can capture all of them. This is just c1 plus c2 plus c3 and so on. Now all I'm going to do is I break out the two cases. And then I multiply them by their costs. So in case 2, I have a cost of 1. And it happens n minus the ceiling of log base 2 of n times. So this is just going to be case 2 right here. So this is just case 2. Remember, these are your red squares. And then I just, so all I'm doing is I'm taking out all of the ones that happen in case 2. Then I have all the ones that happen in case 1. So I'm just splitting apart all of this sum into these two cases. This is a common trick. Now, this is where you have to be a bit careful, is writing out what each of these cases means. So remember, every single time I do case 1, it happens when i minus 1 is a power of 2. So whenever I look at each one of those cases, I'm going to have each one of those when it's one, one less than a power of 2. So Whenever I write down i here, so I can write down i, but remember, I want to have a nice general formula. So I don't have to discard some of these i's and some that aren't. But remember, last oh, down there on the board over here, I just told you that it happens every time i minus 1 is equal to 2 to the power 0, 2 to the power 1, 2 to the power 2. So all I'm going to do is I'm gonna, just going to rewrite. So remember, i minus 1 is going to be equal to some, some power of 2. So I'm just going to rewrite this as, OK, well, what's, what's i? In all of these cases, it's going to end up being 2 to the power of k plus 1. So for each of the powers of 2 from 0 all the way up to the log base 2 of n minus 1, I'm just going to substitute in 2 to the power of k plus 1. That's where k is right here. That's what it's going to represent. So all I've done is I've isolated out those case 1 situations by just resubstituting it as what it is. It's just whenever 1 less than a power of 2 happens. So now, let me just whip this up. So watch this, watch this. Now, I'm going to skip a few steps here, but if you want the full analysis, just check the notes. I do have the full workout there. Uh, you'll end, so if I skip a couple of steps here, notice that I have n minus this, and then you'll end up simplifying this down a little bit further. Uh, if I end up with this, then I, if I keep going, so I'm just going to skip a few steps here. It's actually technically one. I'm going to end up with n plus the sum from 0 to the ceiling of log base 2 of n minus 1 of 2 to the power k. What I did is I actually I split this sum, this sum into two separate sums. And you'll notice that I end up with log base 2 of n minus 1 ones. And that ends up canceling out with these guys. <laughs> so with those log base 2 of n's right there. So all of that right there. So I end up with just the n plus everything with the 2 to the power of k's in that sum. That says that's all that's going to happen. So all I've done is I've distributed out the sum, and then I canceled out some terms. So if you look at this, you might say, damn, what the heck is that? That's actually the, uh, that's the ge finite geometric series. There is actually a closed form for this. This is one of those ones I wouldn't expect you to memorize for this class. I do, but I do have a list of them on the course website. If I ever asked you for them, I would give you a list of them. So like on a test or something, I would give you the actual list of, of these. Uh, so I have n plus 1 minus 2. If I, so this is from the finite uh, geometric series. So this is the finite geometric series that I'm just using here. If you simplify this down a little further, uh, you'll end up with, uh, actually, I just simplify it. I should get n plus 2 to the power of the ceiling of log base 2 of n. 
So two to the power of the ceiling of log base two of n minus one. Just gonna separate that. Then I'm going to just perform a little trick here just to bound it because the ceiling of this, a ceiling of log base two of n is always going to be no more than the log base two of n plus one. Because if I round it up, it can be no greater than another integer. So I'm just going to bound this. But if I simplify this down a little further, I have this plus one here. I can pull out a two, a factor of two. So I end up with n plus two times two to the power of log base two of n. Now, can anybody tell me what's two to the power of log base two of n? Just think back to the definition of what a logarithm is. It's n, it's n, perfect. So, but this is equal to n, but watch this. So now this is n plus 2n, but that's equal to 3n. Now watch this, watch this. So I'm just going to put the conclusion over here. I kind of ran out of space here. Therefore, the cost, the cost of insert, or put, whatever you'd like to call it, is, so I'm just going to take t of n over n, which is going to be less than or equal to 3n over n, which is exactly equal to 3. Amortized. But what's 3 in terms of big O? It's big O of 1. Which is big O of 1 time amortized. Okay, so using this, now you can actually see that when I do n operations for an insert into an unsorted array, it's actually that you'll notice that our amortize is not big O of n, now it's big O of 1, so it's constant. So just I want to mention just one brief thing, I'm going to let you go in one moment. Um, so I just want to mention that uh, this is to just, so this justifies what is called geometric growth. Uh, geometric growth. So I'll take called geometric growth uh, of an array. So doubling the length of the array, shrinking the array by a factor of a half. Like these are these are good choices because you end up with insertions where you end up having big O of one amortized. Now, just as a remark, if you're wondering about how this works in some programming languages, uh, if you're curious about Java, for example, Java has the array la array list class. Uh, they actually use a growth factor. So our growth factor in our example was two. They use a growth factor of 1.5. So I'll put ex another example in the notes, justifying for you why you can't, like why adding only a constant amount actually yields a linear time amortized cost or amortized complexity. So I'll show, so just to see if you want to see why just adding a constant, like constant to the length as opposed to doubling it, just check the notes. I'm going to have another example of how to do this, okay? So I'm going to let you guys go. I'm really sorry about going over a few more minutes here. So that being said, when we come back, uh, we'll talk a little bit, maybe a bit more about this. If not, we'll proceed right to uh, the next topic. So I say thank you very much and have yourself a good weekend. I'll see you later.